Hello guys, Winston here. We've all seen cuts like this at some point, right? Ragged, splintery, stringy, disgusting, disappointing. Chances are, if you're cutting wood, you've encountered a cut like this that isn't as clean as you'd like. This isn't a huge setback if you're just routing the outer profile of a sign or something simple, and you can quickly sand its edges smooth. But if you're doing something with a lot of vertices and exposed surface area, like a grid fin trivet, then hand finishing is going to be a huge pain. People often turn to downcutting end mills for a better surface finish in wood, and it's true that they can improve your cuts. But every end mill geometry has its pros and its cons, and that's what I want to explore today. To do that, I'll be cutting some test pieces out of oak and plywood, two materials that in my past experiences can be more problematic than others to work with. I'll be using both upcutting and downcutting end mills for these tests, as well as a compression end mill from Harvey Tool. Compression cutters have flutes that pull material up from the bottom and push down from the top. They're designed to prevent delamination of composites, and they also work pretty great in woodworking applications, as I'll show in a bit. Our test geometry is a square block a little over 3 inches wide, half an inch thick, with a 2 inch diameter circle cut out of the middle. We'll be doing contour cuts with shallow passes about a sixteenth of an inch deep, followed by a finishing pass with quarter inch step downs. Let's start with your traditional upcut end mill. On both oak and plywood, you get the characteristic fuzzy edge on the top surface, and the bottom of your cut is pretty clean for the most part. Nothing really groundbreaking here. Moving on to the down cut, we have an exceptional surface finish on the top, but the bottom isn't looking too great. My test setup has a small groove cut underneath the edge of my part, which was primarily to help me locate my stock, but it also introduces sort of a worst case scenario aspect to this test. For a down cutting end mill to work best, your stock should ideally be fully supported across the entire area of the cut. Otherwise, you're basically just taking the experience of an upcutting end mill and flipping it upside down. So, if your wasteboard is pretty chewed up or has gaps or channels in it, you should probably lay a fresh sheet of MDF or something under your workpiece before cutting. Though it's a very minor factor, you might even want to consider your work holding method. Double sided tape will introduce an air gap under your part. PO2 Permacell that I'm using here is 8 thousandths of an inch thick. Two layers of standard masking tape is 11, and that's before you add CA glue. The more gap between your part and solid support, the greater the risk of fibrous stragglers hanging onto your piece. But like I said, tape is a very minor contributor. If you're planning on using a downcutting end mill with something like vacuum work holding, then good luck. The other big drawback to using downcutting end mills is chip clearing. These cutters don't pull material out of the way. In deep channels, you can't cut aggressively as you could with an upcutting end mill, otherwise you'll just end up jamming sawdust into the floor of your pocket. So in general, downcutting end mills are slightly slower to work with. But enough about those, let's get to the interesting stuff. This is Harvey Tools 994416-C4 compression end mill for composites, which they've graciously sent me for the purposes of this test. It's a quarter inch tool with two upcutting flutes, two downcutting flutes, and a quarter inch of overlap. The results in oak are basically what you'd expect. After a finishing pass, the top and the bottom edges are both clean. But in plywood, the veneer faces get so torn up that they can't be salvaged by the finishing operation. The initial shallow passes cut exactly like a purely upcutting end mill. Part of this is my fault for buying cheap veneer plywood, the other part of it is also my fault, because there are tool pathing strategies that will work around this problem that I didn't use. Ideally, when you cut with a compression end mill, you plunge deep enough that your down cutting flutes are always in play. With this end mill, cuts shallower than a quarter inch don't give you any advantage over an upcutting end mill. And that's where fusion comes to the rescue. Adaptive clearing with the right ramping criteria will get you into most spaces and let you cut with the tool engaged as deep as you need it to be, while limiting the stress on your machine and your work holding method. With a new tool path that maintains an appropriate depth of cut, I got a great surface finish on my plywood. This is why compression end mills are awesome. Just don't forget that there are situations where they don't work as well, like shallow cuts that don't plunge below the flute crossover point. And of course, cost is also a bit of a disadvantage. A compression end mill runs about two to three times what a regular end mill costs, but it does basically work as two end mills in the right situations. When I was making my grid fin trivets, I'd considered starting my walls with a down cutting end mill and switching to an up cut after a few passes, but the amount of time I'd spend changing tools and re-zeroing my machine each time was so discouraging that I never followed through with it. A compression end mill would have more than paid for itself in terms of time saved in my production process, maintaining quality while simultaneously reducing the amount of manual finishing I needed to do after machining. So in conclusion, talk to your local tool vendor if you think compression end mills might be right for you. 
Serious side effects may occur if you are doing shallow pocketing operations or slotting without an adaptive toolpath. Stop using compression end mills if you experience a lack of Fusion 360 in your life. And that's all I wanted to talk about for this video. Before I sign off, I want to let my Patreon folks know that this week I'm kicking off my recycling program. Today, I'm getting rid of this two-tone magnetic ring box. This misfit was left over from my production run, and it's doing me no good sitting on my workbench, so if you want it, just leave me a comment over on Patreon. I'll pick one of you to send this to next week and cover shipping up to $5, which is most of North America. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and also thank Harvey Tool for providing the end mill I used. I'll have a link to that cutter in the description below. They also have an awesome selection of specialty cutting tools, and even if you're not in the market for any of them, they're pretty sweet to admire. I'll be back next week with another CNC project, some pieces of which were machined in this video.